Well, I'm very glad to be here. Um, and I, I, I really do love your pastor so very much. He's one of my favorite speakers. He is incredibly smart. I don't know if you know this. I have served with him on boards in colleges and have really been blessed by all the Lord has gifted him with. And now my son gets to serve with him, which has been such a wonderful thing. And I, I thank you. Um, so I want to introduce my family to you. Uh, this is a picture of my family. Uh, these are my treasures, right? This is, this, I've, got, I've got five kids and now one granddaughter. Um, my youngest son, James, uh, is sort of the delight of the family. He brings his own special characteristics to the family. Uh, the Lord has taught us so very much through this guy, continues to teach me through him. So um, I'm, I'm very blessed. You know, and I, as I, I begin with that is, is because I want to talk to you about the fact that you and I are on a journey and the experiences of our lives are like chapters in a book. And some of the chapters in the book, we feel like we're writing them. Like, for instance, when I asked my wife to marry me for the third time, and she finally agreed. And then we got married, and then I brought her back to the Philippines, and she woke up that first morning, turned over, and saw this wooden hand-carved statue of an Igorot guy who was one foot on, the, on a body, the other foot with a head in hand, and the other foot with a sword. She wakes up, and she turns over, and she goes, Eddie, what is that? I said, isn't that cool? <laughs> when I was 10 years old, I took the meager savings I had, and I was in Baguio. I met someone who has been to Baguio, and, and I went through the market, and I found this statue, and I bargained all the way down to the point where I could actually buy this. My wife says to me, my new wife says to me, Eddie, this has got to go. <laughs> I said, man, Cindy, I, I, no, 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 I mean like, like right now. Can you please go take this out of here? You know, when you marry a wife, your life changes. <laughs> I had no idea. And then with, when you have a child, your life changes. That magical moment when the doctor comes and puts a baby in your arms and there didn't used to be this person and now... They're here, and they will always be part of your life in profound and meaningful ways. And I promised myself and people around me that when I became a grandfather, I would not be one of those over-the-top doting grandfathers. That's ridiculous, right? And I can't help it. These are the chapters of our lives. These are the experiences that shape us, that change us forever. There are also some experiences in chapters that we didn't write. They feel like they happened to us. And we're really not sure how to move forward in this section. And those are really tough times. And if you don't, if you don't get it right, it, it can trip you up forever. And so I want to just go to Isaiah chapter 6, which is one of my, I, I, this is an incredible encounter. It is an encounter of the great prophet Isaiah, who cannot love Isaiah, who interpreted and wrote a theology about the death of Christ hundreds of years before it ever happened. Like even the disciples couldn't figure out what in the world's going on. And then they would go back to the book of Isaiah and they would read things like he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And th then they begin to understand, oh my goodness, that's just what happened. But Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, has an experience that would mark him forever which probably enabled him and led him to the point of writing some of the great prophecies that we hold very dear. Isaiah 6.1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to the other, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. 
The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Isn't that so sweet? Also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, Lord, uh, send me. So I've, I've, got, I've got three points, and I want to begin with the first one, which is this. Did you know that trouble in your life is unavoidable? There are chapters in our, our future that will be written because of the trouble that we will encounter. It will surprise us. It'll be more painful than we could ever have imagined. We're not going to know if we're going to make it through. And it, we're going we're to have to decide how are we going to respond to this. And how we respond to trouble in our life especially with regard to our relationship with God, it is absolutely going to shape us and the generations that follow us. Now, the beginning of this, this passage begins with this simple statement. statement uh, the, the death of King Uzziah in the year that he died. Okay, so what in the world does that have to do with anything? It has everything to do with everything. You see, in 742 B.C., 750 years before Jesus came, 2 Chronicles 26 records the life and the death of King Uzziah. He was a remarkable man. He became king at the age of 16, and for 52 years he reigned. That's a long time. And it says this, And as long as the king sought guidance from the Lord, God gave him success. Now, I don't know about you, but that gives me motivation to seek guidance from the Lord. Because there are seasons in my life where it feels like everything I'm doing is not working. I need to seek guidance from the Lord. And God actually can give people another measure of success. I mean, that's, that's amazing. He defeated his enemies, fortified the nation. He built an amazing army that was well-equipped militarily. Under his, his leadership, the economy expanded. People prospered. It was a great time of expansion. He was an expert administrator. He was gr a great military strategist. The people who had grown under, up under his leadership, I mean, those 52 years, can you imagine everybody 52 and under, they never had experienced leadership that was poor. They were under the leadership of King Uzziah. And it, th they lived in the best times in the history uh, of, of Judah. Now, it is said about Uzziah that next to Solomon, he probably was the greatest king. And then he died. And he didn't just die. His death was an extremely painful and difficult and confusing, confusing uh, uh, tragedy. Second Chronicles 26, this describes what happened. This is the downfall of King Uzziah. So his fame spread, this is 2 Chronicles 26, 15. So his fame spread far and wide, for he was marvelously helped until he became strong. Who, who was helping him? God was helping him. And then he became strong. And he got a little cocky. And he got a little independent. And he began to believe his own press releases, that he was all that. And he was helped until he became strong and didn't need the help, he thought. And the blessing ceased. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. I mean, so he, he leaves his lane. you got to stay in your lane. Do you know how you survived the 405? See, I'm trying to, like I know, right? I do know. You've got to stay in your lane. You can't go. I don't know what the posted speed limit is, but today? I, uh, oh, goody. Because I told my wife, Cindy, these people are going 80 miles an hour. The only way you survive in the interstate is to stay in your lane. 
And the king decided he was so great, I, don't, I can own all the lanes. So he goes to the temple, and he's going to offer incense. And the priest comes up to the king and withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah. I mean, this takes some courage. You are speaking to the most powerful man in the whole country. It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall, you shall have no honor from, from the Lord. Don't do this. Then Uzziah became furious, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry, the priest, with the priest, I mean, he's, he's pushing on. Leave me alone, guys. I'm the king. I'll do what I want. Leprosy broke out on his forehead and be, before the priests in the house of the Lord besides the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and there on his forehead he was leprous. And so they they're pushing the king out. Indeed, he also hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him and he could feel the leprosy spreading. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. And then he died. You know, when King Uzziah died, it was traumatic not only for the king, but for the nation. The king who started so well ended so tragically. It's, it's, it's awful. And I just beg God, please don't let me do that. Would you please help me to maintain a humble spirit would you help me to seek you and follow you I, man i know i can get cocky let me tell you i got stories to tell chapters i've written i don't want to tell you about them you know when trouble comes um for uzziah that was his trouble the stability and the prosperity that had been a part of the reign of uzziah the security, the predictability. I mean, you know, people starting businesses need predictability. They need security. You know what I'm trying to say? But when everything's falling apart, nobody knows what to do. When the king dies, the power vacuum is noticed not only inside of the country, but outside of the country. And Syria and the surrounding powers begin to reposition themselves because they will take advantage. They, they will take advantage where they can. Stock market goes down. I don't know if they had a stock market. They probably didn't. Um, anyway, they had stuff. The future is uncertain. Consumer confidence. Everything got turned upside down. It was not a good moment. The vision of Isaiah comes at a moment of this national crisis. Did you know that every crisis in our lives, every painful moment, every confusing, unexpected trial is a fork in the road. And we decide in that moment what we're going to do with our pain and confusion. Unfortunately, in my ministry, I have seen people who have come to a time of tragedy, whether it is a child who has just lost a parent and they don't know how the world's going to work now, whether it's a parent who has lost a child and they can't imagine how they're going to keep going, whether it's somebody whose marriage ended, I mean, this, this marriage is done. I mean, it's, it, it's not, it's, it's over. And people, when we get to those moments, we're not quite sure what to do, and we're at a fork in the road, and we're going to have to decide, are we going to go with much of the crowd who likes to just blame God for everything wrong in the world? Have you ever heard people say that? Are we going to be saying, why, why, why? Why did God do this? Why has God allowed this? It, 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 you, will either, you will either put up clenched fists in anger and protest, or you'll put up open palms and surrender. And I don't know what your crisis is, has been, Certainly we don't know what's going to come tomorrow. But you will be tempted to blame God and fight God. And, and when you do that, you separate yourself from the only one who could help you. Um, one of my, you know one of the stories I hate so much in the Bible, is that a lot, can I say that? Okay. I hate the story of how John the Baptist died. I mean, it makes me mad. 
Are you kidding me? This great prophet, John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, he gets thrown into prison and he finally gets his head chopped off because of this silly, manipulative, pseudo-wife of the king who has the daughter dance and then ask for his head on a platter. And the king now actually has to cut his head off. And I'm like, God, how in the world does that happen? That is, that, where in, what does that have to do with anything? And then Jesus, just before this happens, uh, John the Baptist is asking. He's stuck in prison. Will you, will you go find out if Jesus is really the one or do we still wait for somebody? You know, if I was John the Baptist, this is what I'd be thinking. Hey, how come my angel hasn't come and opened the, the door of this prison? How come Jesus hasn't come here personally and, and get, given me some encouragement? What, what in the world is God doing? Here I am. I am the prophet. I've been serving God since I was, before I was born. And now I'm stuck in prison? And Jesus sends, says this in Matthew eleven sixteen: 16. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. You know what that means? We gotta stay in our lane. We gotta let God be God, even when he doesn't do what we think he should be doing. Because he is the transcendent, eternal God who sees eternity. And while it may look, and I have these times in my life, it may look like it is a wrong plan. And while I am tempted to blame God and fight God and complain against God, it is important for me to remember what Isaiah does. You know what Isaiah does? He seeks God in his confusion and in his pain. Now, my son James that you saw, when he was born, um, we didn't know that he would be born with special needs. It was such a shock. We had no idea about this whole thing. We were so ignorant. When he was born in the Philippines, he was born at about seven pounds, but within six weeks, he was under five. He was literally dying in our arms because he just couldn't get the sex, swallow, breathe stuff going on. Like, I mean, we, we learned a lot afterwards, but... We finally were, were told by um, our pastor, who was the pastor where I am now pastoring, you probably need to bring that baby back to the States and see if we can get some specialists to take a look at him. And, and, and so we, we, Cindy and I loaded up with James and our, my younger daughter, Coco, and we got on a plane, we flew to Korea. And in the, in the airport, all of a sudden, James, he was such a tiny little guy. He was four pounds plus. We carried him on a pillow because we were afraid to hold him. That's a long way from the Philippines. We didn't know if his body could handle being held. So we literally had a pillow. And in Korea, that's only a four-hour, three-and-a-half, four-hour flight from Manila, all of a sudden, Cindy looks to me and says, Eddie, I need you to get out all of the water we have in our bags right now. I mean, right now, get it out right now. I said, what, what's going on? She says, look at this baby. He is turning red. He is so hot to the touch. I don't know what's happening to him right now, but I've got to cool him down. So she, she starts pouring water on him and, and trying to, to, to calm him down. And then she turns to me and says, Eddie, I want you to promise me something right now. If this baby dies in my arms now or on the plane, we are not going to tell anybody we're going to pretend that he's still alive because I cannot bear to have a dead baby in a foreign country where I don't even understand what's going on or en route anywhere. I need to get home to my mom. Okay, I promise. We got to the States, put him straight into the hospital from the airport, and then we began, our, began to learn a lot of things like the doctor came in and says, you know, I need to get a, an occupational therapist to come and see him and a physical therapist to come see him and, and a speech uh, therapist to come and see him. And, and, I, and I, I turned to Cindy and I said, okay, I don't get this. Like, you know, he's only six weeks old. Are we, con are we concerned that he's not talking yet? <laughs> I mean, you know, isn't it a little young to talk about an occupation? <laughs> I mean, I was this ignorant, seriously. 
Now therapists are my heroes. I'm telling you, they do miracles. And this therapist taught this little boy of ours how to suck, swallow, and breathe. And we fed him until he began to gain a little weight. And we were rejoicing. But that began nine months of a season for me where I was mad at God. I remember my prayers. Here I am, a missionary. Okay, how embarrassing is this? But it's true. I said, God, so, you know, I'm trying to do your work here, and we're planning churches, and, and now I have this, this baby that's going to require a lot of medical attention, a lot of extra hours in the traffic because the, the specialists aren't very close. It's an hour downtown and an hour back, or maybe three, <laughs> you know? What, what are you doing? What are you thinking, God? This does not make me more efficient or productive. I don't know what you're doing. And my wife is an angel of faith, I'm telling you. Me, I'm a complaining fool. For nine months, I prayed. I prayed for a miracle. I believe in miracles. I believe God can do whatever he wants. You have not because you ask not, right? So ask. Don't make the mistake of not asking. That's my opinion. We didn't get a miracle. Our little baby started growing. We got, started getting to know him. Learned a lot about everything that was going on. Found ourselves in the middle of a community of people with similar circumstances that we never would have met otherwise. But about nine months for me complaining to God in the most religious way, the most missionary pastor way, it's ugly. Um, I was out. There was a, a subdivision with a few houses, and I, I would just go walk up and down the hills. And one day I was praying slash complaining. And in a moment, it's like the Lord dropped something into my soul that sounded and felt like this. I didn't hear any voice, no. It was like God said to me, Eddie, um, I'm God and you're not. And if I want to give a baby with special needs and complications, I can. And I don't have to tell you why. I do not have to ask your permission because I'm God. And you're not. You can either continue with clenched fists or you can open your palms in surrender and ask for the help you're going to need. I began to weep. I'm glad nobody was around, literally. And in that moment, I said, okay, God, clearly you're God and I'm not. I don't know how to be, feel, don't know what to do. I'm not in charge of my life or my future or my family. So I just surrender to you. I had the most incredible peace sweep over me in that moment of surrender. All of a sudden, while everything was not okay, I, for the first time in about a year, was okay. My peace is because there is a good God in heaven whose understanding and goodness transcends time and space. And when I surrender to him and ask for his help, He'll get it. Um, Isaiah goes and he seeks the Lord in the temple, which is such an interesting response. That's, a, that's an open palm expression. God, I'm coming to the temple. I, I don't know what's going on. 
And Isaiah experiences something so magnificent. Um, it's, like, it's like the curtain is pulled back and he sees God high and lifted up on his throne. God is so magnificent according to this particular passage that the experience of Isaiah was, I mean, it's like the train of God's glory came into the temple. That's all that was close to him. And he falls face down. And all he can say is, woe is me. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among the people with unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king of glory. I love this. Isn't that so beautiful? That God would show himself. That God would, through the, through the, the Holy Spirit, instruct for this experience of Isaiah to be written down for us to see and read a God who is so transcendent and powerful and yet he wants to come close you know um, a lot of people I hear talk about God well who is God to you people love to answer that question well he I mean, to me, God is like, well, you know, I mean, I, th I, th I think that God shouldn't do this or do that. And, and um, you know, it, what, what I feel about God is, uh, I like to think about God in these terms. Have you ever had conversations like this? Um, I guess what comes to my mind is, who do you think you are? You think you get to define God? He uses human words to describe an eternal, transcendent, all-powerful, infinite, righteous, holy God whose glory fills the temple. Who, when the seraphims cry out, holy, 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 there is such thunderous power in their communication that it rocks the pillars of the great temple. You know, the only way, the only way to survive life and know God is to surrender. Um, the, the third thing is admit your sin and your struggle. Isaiah does this. I don't think it's wrong to say, God, I am so confused. God, I am so grieved. God, it hurts so much. Oh, God, I don't even know what to do. I, it, it's one thing to say it with that tone. It's another thing to say, God, what in the world are you thinking doing? I am so hurt. And I'm Okay. It's all in the tone. It's all in the posture. Is it a posture of surrender? Or is it a posture of challenge and demanding? Isaiah, he admits who he is, his sinful ways, and he surrenders. Grace is the only way uh, you and I can exist in the presence of God. We must surrender. You know, today I, I just want to tell you that um, my James is the greatest delight of our family. You know, James is my sidekick. We go to the gym. Because I got, I got to, you know, go to the gym. And I'm trying to get there four to five times a, a week. And, and James can't be left at the house by himself. So he goes with me. And he works out too. I love his workouts. I kind of peer over my shoulder. He grabs those dumbbells and he's like... <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, he thinks he's awesome. <laughs> he literally thinks he's... I'm not joking you. James, who cannot write, loves, he has notebook after notebook after notebook. And it's just this squiggly lines, very consistent, line after line after line after line, page after page. What, what is that, James? That's my plan. <laughs> and the Lord says, you know, Eddie, you know what your problem is? You think you're so smart. And when you're not really good at anything, you shut down and don't even try. Look at this guy. 
I told James the other day, James, you know what? You're my favorite sidekick going to the gym. Now, have you ever seen the movie Sky High? If you, if you haven't, you'll never understand this. Just see the movie. It's funny. Everybody in the movie is either a hero, they have superpowers, or if you didn't get your superpower, you're a sidekick. Okay. That's his understanding of that word. So I says to him, James, you know you're my favorite sidekick. He says, Dad, no, Rero. <laughs> okay. But, but James, sidekick is a word that means buddy, like friend, like someone who's... So you are my favorite sidekick. No, hero. Okay, you're my favorite hero. Okay, so it's never boring. You know, one thing I've learned about my son James, too, is um, my love for my children has nothing to do with their IQ. Or their ability. And that makes me feel like maybe God is okay with me and loves me. Because I don't always feel like a hero. Um, surrendering to God's plan and trusting His grace even when it hurts, is such a better alternative to fighting God. You can't get in his lane. You kidding me? Not possible. I just want to close with a story of somebody who's inspired me so very much. And um, when my kids, uh, my, my kids ha were about the same age as the children of a couple Marsha and Gracia Burnham, I don't know if you've ever heard of them, they were kidnapped by a terrorist group, the Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines, uh, on May 27, 2001. They were abducted. And they were celebrating their 18th anniversary, so their kids weren't with them. It was just them at this, this island resort in the Philippines. And they were taken by the Abu Sayyaf, and they were held hostage. They were held hostage for over a year. And it really, it, it, it wasn't like a news story to us because we were part of the same missionary community. Although we weren't personal friends of the Burnhams, we knew, friend, we had friends that were friends of theirs and one of the teachers was related to Martin Burnham. And so, and you know, in some regards as a, as a missionary family, one of your worst fears in the world is that, that your kids would be kidnapped or you would be, kidnapped and and then it happened to them and so we prayed all the time for the burnhams and it was so so difficult um and then on june 7 2002 after over a year of being held captive and going through the jungles there was a, a battle for, with the military and in that battle Martin was killed, and Gracia was wounded. She was rescued. She was then sent back to the States, and finally she was reunited with her three children who had been without their parents for more than a year. Can you imagine that? Um, after I became uh, the pastor at High Street, I, I so much wanted to invite Gracia Burnham to come and speak, and so she did come and speak for us. And I remember that the night before she was going to be our guest and um, that we had dinner with her and some of the missionary missions committee and myself and my wife. And we sat there and it was, it was a great time, you know, to like see her past the TV, you know. Uh, she has written two books, um, In the Presence of My Enemies is her first book and then To Fly Again is her second book. And so there's, here's a woman who is, knows what it's like to endure tragedy, painful, painful tragedy. And as we sat and talked, we exchanged stories and talked about who, who were our mutual friends. And she even mentioned that she grew up in a church in uh, the Kansas City area that um, prayed for the lions in the lion's den. That's my family. I couldn't believe it. She actually, had, I always thought that was the corniest thing that my dad loved so much, um, the lions in the lion's, the lion's den. So, but she, 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 we had that connection and we, we talked to her the whole night. And toward the end of our meal, I, I 
just begin to think, wow, she seems so okay, but like her kids, their daddy never attended any of the graduations. And he was never there for any of the weddings. And I just had this overwhelming sense of sadness and grief come over me. As we were leaving, I said to Gracia, Gracia, I just want to say I'm so sorry for your great loss. Martin's not here anymore. And Gracia Burnham responded immediately with a smile and said, he is worthy. Wow. She stayed in her lane. She had surrendered even the painful parts of her life to the Lord. His strength was all over her, even when some of those things could never be fixed. And only eternity will balance the books because the loss will be outstanding in that family until they get there. Today, I'd like to ask you to bow your heads if you would. Um, I don't know where you are, but I do know this. If any experience in your life has made you angry at God and you've turned away from him. God would say to you, I know what happened. And yeah, I let that happen. And I know it grieves you greatly and it's so hard and difficult. But I'm God and you're not. And so I'm going to ask you to just surrender to me and trust me. So whatever that is for you today, right there in your seat, would you say, God, I, I, it still hurts. I'm still confused. But I will let you be God because you are. And I will just raise open palms and ask for the help I need. Teach me how to be in this moment. I surrender to you.